All right, and with that, thank you, Mr. Russ, for all that direction. Uh, we're going to call this 2022 annual meeting to order. If everyone would please stand and face the flag for our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you for that. And Mr. Russ, if you could just remind us of our SASD mission statement, please. Glad to. SASD's mission statement is the following, to educate all students academically, emotionally, and socially to inspire curiosity and resilience. Next, I would like to read the published notice of this meeting. The meeting has been noticed to Evans Print and Media Group, WCOW Radio, Magnum Radio, La Crosse Tribune, Sparta City Hall, and Sparta Free Library. This is a meeting of the electric. Attendees who are eligible to vote and are residents of the Sparta Area School District in attendance may participate. I'd like to go over some introductions and procedures. Welcome to the Sparta Area School District's meeting of the electric, not an official school board meeting. I am Sam Russ, superintendent of the Sparta Area School District. This meeting is different from our regular school board meetings in that any resident of the district in attendance can vote on the business of the annual meeting. A reminder to all that when a proposed budget is approved by this annual meeting, it is an advisory document, not a binding one. That is, it will be the Board of Education's blueprint moving forward financially and may require adjustments as actual expenditures are incurred. incurred. There are other powers of the annual meeting which we'll be voting upon, which is authorizing the Board of Education to transport, feed, and provide instructional materials to students along with setting board members' salaries and expense reimbursement. I would like to introduce the members of the board and district personnel. Anthony Schulze, John Henricks, Heidi Prestwood, Colin Burns Gilbert, Amy Lopez, Todd Wells, and Pat McKenna. I would like to also introduce district administration, Leah Hauser, Director of Business Services, Kyla Mansky, Director of Instructional Services, and Amber Kulik, Director of Student Services. The four rules are below how are suggested to run the meeting. The first one is we use Robert's Rules of Order, newly revised. Two, vote will be taken by a show of hands in a division of the house, uh, Vote count may be requested. Anyone making a motion or second, please state your name and wait for Mr. Sanders to uh, get the microphone to you. Speakers and anyone who makes a motion will state their name. We will go by, the chairperson will say, do we have a motion? We will wait for the motion. And then if we do have a motion, we will ask for a second. We will have, if you're in favor of the motion, you will signify by raising your hand. And at the appropriate time, if you're opposed, you will signify by raising uh, your hand as well in only one hand, please. Remember that all comments must be respectful and not targeted directly or indirectly to anyone. This is extremely important so that our annual meeting can run smoothly and be a positive experience for all. Please know and respect that if a comment is made that is inappropriate, this will be addressed. Also, Please be aware that not all questions may be able to be answered here tonight. If there are unanswered questions, we will do our best to follow up with the individual or individuals who have asked that. Mr. Schulze, you're up with an election of chairperson. Thank you, Mr. Russ. Okay, we'll be calling for nomination for the annual meeting chairperson to oversee this meeting, and we will follow Robert's rules of order, as Mr. Russ has stated. Uh, we will do this by voting and asking for nominations three different times. Voting may be done by a show of hands, and each nominee will be voted upon. Each elector has one vote for the chairperson. At this time, do I have any nominations? Mr. Asher. Okay, just one moment. We'll get Mr. Sanders over there. Gary Asher, and I'd like to nominate Mr. John Hendricks. All right, uh, should I ask now if, if you would accept that nomination? 
you would accept that. Okay. Do I have any nominations? Mr. Kirchhoff. Raymond Kirchhoff, I'd nominate Anthony Scholze. All right, and I would also accept that. Do I have any nominations? Mrs. Leverage? Marla Leverage, I nominate Gary Asher. Okay. Gary, would you be open to chairing the meeting? At the end of, usually, typically the chairperson makes comments at the very end, if they make comments at all. But typically they're just more in charge of running the more meeting. Okay, so Mr. Asher has declined. All right, so all in favor of Mr. Hendricks, please raise your hand. All right, so we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Okay. That's what I got. Yep. And for Anthony Schulze, please raise your hand. Okay. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. 24. All right, I have 24. Okay, thank you for that. And thank you, Mr. Hendricks, for your willingness to do that. <laughs> okay, do I have any additions to the agenda, Mr. Russ? I do not have any additions. Does right. anyone else have any additions? All right. That said, uh, do I have a motion to adopt the agenda? I make that motion. All right, I have a motion Sam Russ. from Sam Russ to adopt the agenda. Do I have a second? I have a second from Mr. Collins Burn, Colin Burns Gilbert. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Mr. Russ. Our district has started the year on a positive note and a lot has changed since our last district annual meeting. We are looking forward to continuing this positivity that works not to only increase our student achievement, but focuses on building positive relationships with our families and communities, all in an effort to build up the whole child and get them ready for their future. As superintendent, I am focused on building trust and community support through various means, increasing our positive culture and climate, while showcasing the positive happenings in our district that might not be seen by many. I welcome the opportunity to speak with any individual, group, or organization so that they too can see the positives throughout our district. As the more individuals see and understand our school system, the more they will support our students, staff, and community. Our mission and vision are used to continue our work. While our work must be focused on building positive relationships with stakeholders to bring our mission and vision alive every day. We have worked to develop a portrait of a Spartan not just a portrait of a student or a portrait of a graduate, as we believe all of the learning community are Spartans. And if we all can work together with these knowledge, skills, and dispositions, our community and schools will flourish together. Our caring and hardworking staff strives to foster a love of learning with our students, inquiry, power of positive relationships, and perseverance. Before I let Ms. Hauser take us into our budget, I wanted to share some information that many of you may not know about from last year. You may hear about our academic and student achievements, both in and out of our classrooms. But did you know, our district served over 600,000 meals last year. Our before and after school program served 325 students during the regular school year and 180 students during the summer. Our buses drove our students over 520,000 miles last year, and about 85% of our students had less than two, had two, one, or zero office referrals. Our students, staff, and families are working very hard to shape our future, and we are making a difference. Thank you all for coming here tonight for your continued support of our district. Strong communities have strong schools. I would encourage and welcome our community to be a part of our district by volunteering coming to our events and being part of our Board of Education meetings and workshops. We will continue to build ways to strengthen our ties to the community, listen 
and collaborate together for the sake of our students and our community. Thank you and go Spartans. Thank you, Mr. Russ. And with that, we'll move to the treasurer's report as of June 30th, 2022 with Ms. Leah Hauser. Thank you. I will be presenting the treasurer's report, which is for the year ended June 30th, 2022. Uh, this is stating that our district budget and finances are under the regulation of state and federal law, DPI rules and guidelines, and Board of Education policies. Additionally, our financial statements are audited annually by an independent CPA firm. For the year that we'll be reviewing, the audit has uh, is underway, but we have not yet received the final audit report. So these numbers are considered unaudited. Once that final audit report is complete, it will be presented to the Board of Education at a regular board meeting, and it will be posted on the district website. Our district financials are accounted for in accordance with an accounting system that is published by DPI. And that is a fund accounting system with multiple different funds, which I have on the screen here. There's also details on these funds in the audit report that you received upon entering. And I'll go over each of these funds in more detail. The general fund accounts for the general operations of the district or the majority of the cost to educate our students in the district. The revenues for the general fund for 21-22 totaled $42,754,280. And you can see the detail of this on pages 18 and 19 in your book. The bottom uh, of the slide on the left corner also references the page number if you're following along. The major variables in our revenue for the 21-22 school year, where we received $10,000 per student in a combination of state aid and the tax levy, which those together are considered the revenue limit, which I will explain in more detail during the budget hearing. We also received $876 per student in state per pupil categorical aid and another 2.1 million of other state aid. We received over 3.6 million of federal grants, of which about 2.1 million of that was from the ESSER funding, which is the funding that resulted from COVID. All other sources of revenue of the $1.7 million is largely derived from dissolving one of our funds last year, which was Fund 73 for our OPEB trust. For our general operating fund expenditures, our expenditures totaled $41,837,640. 26 million of that was for salaries and benefits, another 2 million to support instructional services through purchased uh, professional development and instructional materials, 40,000 for student services, including uh, health and well being. Buildings and grounds had just shy of $960,000. That was not only for custodial and routine maintenance, but also for the large projects that occurred last year. We had a $700,000 transfer to Fund 46, which is our capital improvement trust fund to, for, uh, to provide for future capital projects. We had $2.3 million of expense for open enrollment out and another $673,000 of expense for the private school voucher program. We spent $825,000 on technology, both for our students, our staff, and to maintain our district operations, including safety and security. We spent another $2 million on transportation, which includes our contracted services and our fuel. And finally, we spent uh, over 756,000 on utilities for each of our buildings. Fund balance is the residual of the revenue and the expenditures. Uh, it could also be known as equity. And this is uh, 
described in greater detail on page 25. We have non-spendable, restricted, and unassigned fund balance. And our unassigned fund balance, the Board of Education did take action at the end of the year to designate $575,159 for revenue stabilization. And the remaining unassigned fund balance was designated for cash flow or working capital needs. The next fund is our special projects funds. This is fund 21 and fund 27. Fund 21 is where we record all gifts and donations. And fund 27 is where we record the activities for special education. Internally, we combine funds 10 and 27 together, and they're also combined on our audited financial statements because those two funds together uh, are the general operating portion of to educate all of our students in the district. In fund 27, we received over $770,000 of grant revenue uh, for our students with special needs, and we spent uh, five $0.48 million on salaries and benefits. We also spent $600,000 on transportation, and the remaining costs are covered in a transfer from Fund 10. So again, Funds 10 and 27 together are a cost to educate all. And there is no fund balance in 27 uh, because we do that transfer from Fund 10. Our debt service fund. We had revenue of over $5 million, and that is largely due to the tax levy. So our tax levy, uh, one of the portions that it funds is our debt service. The remaining revenue is interest income. And for expenses, we made our required debt payments of over $2.2 million. And we also defeased or paid down debt of $2,849,194. And we do carry a fund balance in Fund 39, and that's to cover the fall debt payments that are due prior to receiving the following year's tax levy. The capital project funds are Funds 46 and 49. Fund 46 is the Long Range Capital Project Fund. And uh, this fund receives its revenue by receiving transfers from Fund 10. And we did transfer $680,000 from Fund 10 to Fund 46. And the expenses in 21-22 were the beginning costs for the Memorial Field Project. Fund 49 is the spend down of the debt proceeds uh, for referendum approved facilities. And so this would be the spend down of the Herman Elementary proceeds. So there was no new revenue because that debt was borrowed a couple years ago now. And the expenses are the continued spend down furnishing our Herman Elementary building. This leaves us with the remaining fund balance of approximately $5.1 million. And this is for the remaining projects in Fund 46, which include the majority of the Memorial Field Project uh, the remaining projects at Herman Elementary, and then also the board has earmarked part of that fund balance for some renovations at the high school in the auditorium. Fund 50 is our nutrition service fund where we record the cost of providing meals and snacks to our students. The revenue in 21-22 was higher than typical due to the offering of universal free meals. This was a federal program that districts participated in and the revenue, uh, the cost of the meals and the program costs were fully covered through federal grant income. The expenses were a little higher than typical as well due to some supply chain issues. We did have a significant increase in our fund balance and this is because the universal free meals program reimbursed at a higher rate than what you would typically get without that program. And lastly, we have Fund 80, which is the Community Service Fund. The total revenues of 525,000 were largely due to the tax levy, which is the third piece of the tax levy. 
And we use those to support the parenting place and when, which is our after school program, and it stands for what I need. The correlating expenses were for parenting place and the when after school program. We did run with a fund balance last year, ending at $108,000. And we are using that fund balance in the 22-23 budget to offset the amount that we would need to bring to the tax levy. And that concludes the treasurer's report. All right, thank you, Ms. Hauser, for that. I appreciate it. Uh, and now, if, oh, please, Mr. Before we continue, yeah. for those in the audiences at home, um, the slides and the, um, the workbook or the, the book that you received when you entered are on our website. If you go to our Board of Education meetings and you go to the agenda, um, it'll all be there for future use and reference. So thank you for that, Mr. Russ. Yes, appreciate it. Okay, and now we will uh, we'll have the presentation of the 22-23 budget, and then we will have the hearing. Is that what you're going to ask, Mr. Asher? Yeah, as soon, we're going to do the presentation of the 22-23 budget, and then we're going to open up the floor for all discussion. All right. Thank you, Ms. Hauser. Go ahead. Thank you. So for the 22-23 budget presentation, I'll be going back through the funds that we just reviewed, but in a little bit more detail. So again, if you'd like to follow along, I would have you flip back to page 18 in your books and we'll pretty much follow the pages now. I won't go into as much detail on some of the things as what you have in your book, uh, which is why you all have a copy to review at your leisure after the meeting. And then I also wanted to comment that this 22-23 budget being presented is still preliminary in nature, meaning the board has not approved it. However, we have reviewed it in great detail. Uh, there are still some final pieces for our budget that we're waiting on from the state regarding our revenue limit and our state aid. And those are scheduled to be released by October 15th. So uh, we are presenting the best information that we know at this time, and any updates will be reflected to the board when they approve the original budget at the full board meeting at the end of the month. So we'll start with Fund 10. And in short, as I mentioned earlier, Fund 10 is used to account for all financial transactions relating to the district's current operations. And in short, Anything that specifically needs to be quoted elsewhere is designated by DPI. Otherwise, it goes into Fund 10. And again, you have the detailed budget in your book. For the slides, uh, you'll see a summary. So we're proposing total revenue of $40,363,242 with total expenses of 40,924 and 64, I'm sorry, $40,924,064. This revenue is made up of $10,000 per student under the revenue limit, which is the same amount of funding per student that we received this year. This is because 22-23 is in the second year of the state's biennium and that amount is already set. We also are budgeting per pupil categorical aid of $742 per student, which is down from $876 per student last year. This budget also reflects the use of ESSER funding of approximately $1.6 million. And it also reflects the additional uh, federal and state funding for ESSER of $330,000 that was announced just a few months ago. This chart is showing our total revenue by source. So we have local sources, inter-district payments, state sources, federal sources, and other revenue. Our local sources, the main uh, source of revenue is the tax levy, and the state sources, the main source of revenue is state aid, state equalization aid. For the expenses, I'll be presenting the expenses in three different ways. 
And again, the detailed expenses are in your book. So we can present the expenses by function, by object, and by category. This first chart, chart is showing them by function. And function, in essence, is the purpose for why the expenditure is taking place. What is it supporting? And you can see that 53% of our expenditures that we're anticipating for 22-23 are for instructional costs, with 26% being for support costs and the remaining 20% being for non-program costs. Instructional costs, when you look at the detail, include all of the function series that start with a one, so the 100000 series, as well as the 210000 and the 220000 series. These costs are the instructional costs for our students, as well as the cost to provide student services and instructional services. And they total $17.5 million in this year's budget. The support costs are the remaining costs in the two series, and they equal approximately $15 million. And then the remaining section for non-program costs is budgeted at $8.4 million. And that's really made up of two main amounts, which is the operating transfer from Fund 10 to Fund 27, as well as the open enrollment out cost. The total expenses by object. Object is what are we paying for? So function was what are we using it for? And object is what are we paying for? So our objects include salaries, benefits, purchase services, supplies, insurance, and transfers. Our salaries and benefits make up the largest portion of our expenses at nearly 63% of our total budget or just shy of $26 million for this coming year. Other than salaries and benefits, the remainder of our budget, the biggest pieces are for purchase services, which is what we contract with others to provide. That equals $8.4 million. We have supplies of $1.7 million and the transfer to the other fund of $4.6 million. The final chart is by category. I do want to comment that in your book, uh, this says fund 10 expenses, and it actually should be 10 and 27. So by category is how we present our budget to the board uh, throughout the year. And it's uh, the reason why is it really tells us where in our district that money is being budgeted and what it's being used for and who's uh, managing those uses. And as I mentioned, funds 10 and 27 together equal the cost to educate all of our students. And that's why we combine them when we look at it by category. So you'll see the salaries and benefits portion of our total uh, operating budget for 10 and 27 is actually up to 71% versus the 60% just in fund 10. And so this shows us that the majority of our costs for special education are for our staffing. The other large pieces are student services and instructional services. These do not include any of the staffing costs, but rather are for any purchase services that we provide, including professional development for our staff, supplies for our teachers and our students, and um, and curriculum materials. The business services component of the budget by category includes our costs for our buildings and grounds, including custodial and maintenance. It's our, all of our costs of technology, including student technology, staff technology, and district technology. It's our transportation contract and the fuel that goes in our buses, our utilities for all of our buildings, our business insurance, and even our payments to the private school voucher program and open enrollment out. And the last piece of our Fund 10 general operating budget is fund balance. And as I mentioned in the treasurer's report, we do have uh, some designations in our fund balance of our unassigned fund balance. 
Uh, and the board set aside $575,159 at June 30th for future revenue instability. Uh, this was the board acknowledging that we uh, have a tighter budget for the 22-23 and that uh, they were giving approval to use fund balance for part of that budget uh, in 22-23. And then the remaining fund balance is the working capital or cash flow needs. Uh, as I mentioned on the summary slide, we are looking at a deficit this year of approximately $560,000. And uh, so the budget will not balance by approximately $560,000. And that is because we intend to use the revenue stabilization for that purpose. Uh, so now we're going to dive just a little deeper in fund 10 into the revenue, and then we'll go back to the other funds. So fund 10, our general operating, the main source of the revenue that we receive to run our district every day comes through in the form of the revenue limit. So the revenue limit is set by the state, and it's not an income source, but rather a threshold, and it determines the maximum amount of operating revenue that we may raise through a combination of our state aid and the local tax levy. And it's calculated by taking our number of students, the funding per student that's determined at the state, adding back any exemptions, and then that comes to our revenue limit. So for 22-23, we are projecting our revenue limit to be $31,745,000, which is a 1.73% decrease as compared to 21-22. Our revenue limit makes up nearly 80% of our total fund 10 revenue. And again, the numbers that I'll be presenting in just a minute are not final because we're waiting for October 15th when the state makes all their final uh, notices to districts. And so we'll present the revised revenue limit to the full board on October 25th. So again, the calculation for revenue limit, number of students, dollars per student, and exemptions. So you can see here a five-year history on the number of students. You'll notice that it's a three-year average. So the FTE, or the student count for revenue limit, is taking the average of three years worth of revenue limits, the most current year and the two years prior. It's the count of the students that we're serving on the third Friday in September in our district, adjusted for any open enrollment students and adjusted by a factor for our pre-K students. It also receives a portion of our summer school students. When we put all of those factors together, we're looking at a decrease for funding purposes in the revenue limit of 21 students. Again, this is a three-year average. Next is the funding per student. And you can see here a five-year history, 22-23, we're expecting the same funding per student as we've had the past two years. This is year two of the biennium. So next year in 23-24, we don't yet know what the amount will be per student. And the final, uh, primary piece of the revenue limit are exemptions. Exemptions are add backs to the revenue limit. This year, the district has three main exemptions that will allow for additional revenue limit authority under state law. In the chart, you can see that the operating referendum of $750,000 dropped off this year. The next bar is our private school voucher expenses. And that is one of the numbers that we do not have yet until October 15th. The next fire, which is new this year, is the declining enrollment exemption. exemption and we're looking at a $210,000 revenue for that. Okay, so as I mentioned, the revenue limit has two pieces that make it up, state equalization aid, as well as the local tax levy. State equalization aid is provided by the state of Wisconsin, 
to support the operations of the public school districts in the state. And really what it does is it identifies how much of our revenue limit must be raised through the local tax levy. Approximately 85% of Sparta's revenue limit is made up of state aid. So this chart isn't our total revenue, it's our revenue limit. So that threshold that determines about 80% of our operating revenue. And 85% of that revenue limit is funded through the state with the remainder being funded through the local tax levy. We're anticipating or budgeting state aid at $26,830,000. And again, this number uh, will be confirmed on October 15th. The district also receives high poverty aid budgeted at $169,236 and exempt computer and personal property aid budgeted at $58,827. Here is a five-year history of the equalization aid. And you can see that we're anticipating an increase this year, even though we had a decrease in our revenue limit. And the reason for this increase is that one of the main components of state equalization aid is called shared cost. And this is commonly referred to as prior year spending. So in essence, the amount that we spend in one year, we receive aid on the following year. In Sparta, our aid is based on our general and debt service funds and the expenses that they have. Again, more spending equates to more state aid. And in 22-23, we're in, uh, budgeting that our increase in our shared costs will be $49,532. Another factor in state equalization aid is enrollment. This is a different enrollment count than what is used for the revenue limit. The enrollment count used in state equalization aid is the prior year's January student count. Our enrollment for this formula is budgeted to have an increase of 76 students for a total of 3,238. And the final piece of the state equalization aid formula is property values. Here you can see a five-year equalized value history. And you can see that we've had steady increases and we had quite a large increase this year with almost 15.6% increase over the prior year. However, we are still considered a low property value per student district, meaning we receive a higher share of state aid than some other districts. And again, receiving more state aid is important because it directly impacts the local tax levy. So the local tax levy actually has three parts. The part that's derived from the revenue limit is that blue section or the first section. So that's the tax levy to support our general operations. There's also two additional pieces that make up our total school levy. The second is Fund 39 referendum approved debt. And the third is Fund 80 to support our community service levy. Here is a five-year history of our total tax levy, also shown the three different pieces. For the 22-23 school year, we're presenting a total school levy budget of $12,280,000, which is an increase from last year of $522,000. Or 4.45%. I'm going to walk through each piece of this total school levy in a little bit more detail. So, the first piece 
which is the tax levy for general operations. Again, it's derived from the revenue limit. Our uh, revenue limit will be more heavily funded by state aid this year, as well as the total revenue limit went down. The byproduct is a decrease to our levy for general operations of nearly one and a half million dollars or a 24% decrease as compared to last year. The second piece of the total school levy is for Fund 39 or our debt service. And this is to pay off the debt from April of 2018 for the facility expansion, expansion project. For 22-23, we have budgeted just shy of $7 million for the debt service levy, which is an increase of $1.9 million or 37.5% over 21-22. This amount is comprised of $2.2 million for our required principal and interest payments, as well as $4,749,000 for debt defeasance. And I will get to debt defeasance in just a little bit. And then the final piece of the total school levy is for Fund 80, our community service fund, which is made up of three different pieces, $20,000 to support the parenting place in Sparta, $500,000 to support the WIN after school program. And this year we are proposing adding co-curricular activities at the middle school for an amount of $105,000. These three programs will equal a total community service levy of $625,000 which is an increase of $105,000 or just about 20%. So when we take that total school levy that's composed of the three different pieces, we then use that to calculate the mill rate, which is what carries through to the property tax bills. The mill rate determines the average tax per $1,000 of property value based on that total school levy. I do want to make sure that we all understand that the amount of change to the mill rate, as well as the percent of change to the mill rate, will, the impact of that will vary on each property tax bill. And the reason that it varies is because each property tax bill, the mill rate is just one figure. There's also assessed values and equalized values. And so it could vary community to community as well as homeowner to homeowner. With the uh, total tax levy that we are proposing of the 12,280,000, that equates to a mill rate of $7.49. And that's what the Board of Education has chosen to present for discussion tonight. This is a decrease of 80 cents from last year. Last year, we were at $8.29, or a 9.66% decrease. And again, you can see a five-year history. Oops, sorry about that. There we go. And then lastly, I wanna talk about uh, this mill rate, how you would see it on your tax bill. So you can calculate the mill rate by taking the net tax for the school district, adding the school levy credits and dividing it by the fair market value. So the mill rate is not published on your tax bill, but you can calculate it. The percent tax change that's published on your bill does not equal the change in the mill rate. This is because the percent tax change is also affected by the assessed value, the fair market value, and the school levy tax credit. At the bottom of your tax bill, you'll see a section for total additional taxes. This represents the total voter approved levy that is in addition to the revenue limit levy. It does not represent a change in taxes as compared to the prior year.
And with that, I will move on to the remaining funds in our district budget. We have Fund 21, which again is used to account for the proceeds of gifts and donations to the district. And this budget uh, is based on prior year, but will be reflected to actual as we receive gifts and donations and use them throughout the upcoming school year. Fund 27, again, is used to account for the cost of providing special education services to students with disabilities. The total revenue is budgeted at $7,345,107, with the main sources of revenue being a transfer from Fund 10, federal grants, including Medicaid reimbursements, and a state reimbursement for a portion of the cost of providing the program. The expenses equal the revenue with nearly $6 million of the expenses being for salaries and benefits, and the next largest cost being for specialized transportation. Fund 39, again, is used for recording transactions related to the repayment of debt issues. And the total revenue for this year is derived from the tax levy. This is based on the budgeted total school levy and mill rate that I just presented. And if those amounts change, the total revenue and expenditures in this fund would also change. Again, there's the ending fund balance due to the timing of the fall debt payment. And the total expenses here equal the proposed required payment of about $2.2 million, as well as debt defeasance of $4.7 million. Here is a list of our outstanding debt balances. So you can see that we have three different issues. The first was a borrowing for $28,105,000 with an interest rate that varies between three and 5%. The remaining principal balance is $23,425,000. Issue number two was the remainder of that debt borrowing for the Herman project, which was for $2.5 million. And that uh, issue will be paid off this year. And the final issue is for a land contract for the land that Herman Elementary was built on and we have one payment remaining for that as well. Uh, here is another update on page 41 for the indebtedness at the end of the year, as well as a graph showing how we've paid down our debt over the past five years. And the reason that our uh, debt has decreased so quickly is because of us utilizing debt defeasance, which debt defeasance is in essence prepaying or paying additional on our debt. And it's beneficial because first of all, it reduces the amount of debt outstanding. It also saves on future interest costs because we're paying that debt off early. And it's considered a shared cost or an expenditure in the state aid calculation, which means we receive state aid on that money that defeasance the following year. That defeasance can also be beneficial if a district is anticipating future referendum debt or a future operating referendum. Next, we have fund 46 and 49, which are capital project funds. Fund 46 is that trust fund that in Sparta was established in November of 2015. And so in 2020, it became available for us to use on projects that were part of our long range capital projects plan. Money gets into Fund 46 in our history through the board transferring excess funds at the end of each fiscal year. 
And the trans the reason for that transfer is those funds also go into the shared cost calculation for state aid, as well as when we sold two of our district buildings, the proceeds from those sales also went into Fund 46. Fund 49, again, is the spend down of the referendum approved debt. And so for us, that would be the Herman Elementary building. And those two funds are combined together for budget reporting purposes. Total revenue is really just interest income. There's no new revenue source anticipated for this year. And total expenses are the projected costs for remaining equipment at Herman Elementary, as well as the majority of the cost for the Memorial Field project. We are looking at carrying a fund balance of approximately $500,000 which has been earmarked for uh, lighting and sound at the high school auditorium. Next is Fund 50, which is our nutrition services fund, which are the revenues and expenditures related to providing uh, our food service program. Our total revenue, we are looking at a decrease because the universal free program has ended and we are back to uh, free and reduced meals based on income levels, as well as uh, paid meals for some students. Our expenditures we are anticipating will continue to increase due to supply chain issues and shortages. And uh, we will be watching the fund balance and this fund closely because of some of those unknown factors going into this next school year. And lastly, we have Fund 80, which is our community service fund. Uh, we again are planning to continue the parenting place, the win after school program, and are proposing adding middle school co-curriculars. That would equate to $630,000 of revenue, which is largely the levy for those three items, as well as any participation fees for community education classes. And the total expenditures exceed the total revenues because again, we had a fund balance last year uh, that will help cover the increasing costs of our WIN program without having to increase the levy this year. That concludes the review for our different budgets, but I also wanted to point out a few pieces of information that are in the appendix in uh, your books. The first, if you go to Appendix A, that's our uh, staffing overview. And the third page there has our employee salaries broken out by employee group or employee class. And so you can see our total spend as well as the percent uh, for each of our different employee groups. The following chart in your book is employee benefits. And these are all of the benefits that incur a cost to the district that we provide to our employees. The largest change is our health insurance. We did realize a large decrease in budget this year, and that's due to some plan redesign and some plan changes for our health insurance. In the next appendix, you'll see our state and federal grants. There are no changes to our state grants. Our federal grants, we do have a new one this year, which is our STEM expansion grant. We also are noticing decreases to our title funding, which is funding that um, helps support many of our instructional activities. And you can also see that we're planning on using $1.6 million of our ESSER budget. For ESSER, you'll see a summary showing the allocation or the amount that we uh, received to budget. You, the next column is how much we've spent as of the end of the 21-22 school year. The next column is how much we're budgeting to use the school year. And then the final column is the available funds which will be planned to be used in the 23-24 school year. 
Uh, thank you. <laughs> And then the last chart that I'd like to point out in the appendix is enrollment. And I want to point out the third um, thing to correct in your book. I apologize, the chart we had open enrollment in twice. It should actually be headcount minus open enrollment in plus open enrollment out to equal the resident count. And then again, you can see a five-year history. And there are definitions in uh, the appendix as far as what the different types of pupil counts are. And that's important if you're looking at our different reports, you may see variances in what it looks like, how it looks like we're counting students. And that's because different student counts are used for different purposes. So when we're planning our staffing, we really look at the head count. That's how many students are in our building each day. There's also a FTE, which again is factored for our pre-K students because they only come to school for half of the day. Uh, and then we also have a student count that we can adjust for open enrollment students and that's used for funding purposes. And then I just wanted to comment that our school level expenses is a report that we file with DPI and it shows the cost to educate our students as it varies school to school. The data in this book is actually two years old at this point, and that's because uh, the reporting for the 21-22 school year is just being finished up. And just with the timing of the annual meeting this year, the overlap didn't work. Um, but when we finish up that report in the next week or so, we'll be giving a report to the Board of Education on the most recent data in November. And so if you're interested in hearing that, I'd encourage you to listen to November's board meeting. And with that, I completed the budget presentation. Right. How's everybody doing out there? All right. So at this time, thank you, Ms. Hauser, for that. We appreciate it. At this time, we'd like to provide an opportunity for discussion on the 22-23 budget prior to going to resolutions. Please be mindful that there may be several electors who wish to speak, so consider keeping your comments to one to two discussion points at a time. Once you're done with those two discussion points, feel free to step to the back of the line. Once you make it back up to the front, you can do it again. This assists um, in providing all electors the opportunity to share their feedback. Electors who wish to speak, please come on down to the microphone and line up behind the podium. This can be done at any point now. You could please state your name. Um, and Mr. Asher, if you can make sure that green light is on, that would be great. You need to push the button. Green Mr. Asher, on. the floor is yours. My name's Gary Asher, and I'd like to address uh, the proposed levy. Um, I know that the school board had a uh, meeting um, some time ago, actually not that long ago, on September, 14th of 2022 and so i went on the board website and downloaded it and to see the facts and numbers that were presented then and i see discussions of a levy of 6.31 and my interpretation of a six dollar and 31 cent levy or 613 613 is that that would cover all the expenses that the district planned for, all the salary increases, all the cost of education and everything, and would provide some true tax relief to the taxpayers. One of the items that you included in the booklet tonight on page 32 is that uh, property values went up in the city of Sparta 15.6% this year. And I believe this is the third or fourth year in a row that the values keep going up. So even though you're proposing a levy of 7.49, it's my understanding that that still re uh, results in a tax increase to the district, that you'll be collecting more in taxes than you did last year. 
And I'm under the impression that a levy of 7.19 would be neutral and that the only way the taxpayers get a true reduction in their taxes is if it's under that 7.19, something like in that 6.13 that you talked about in your workshop. And so first off, are my numbers correct? Uh, you are correct that we presented 613 at the workshop as um, for the start of the discussion. The discussion has been to bring 749 forth tonight. As far as where we would be budget neutral or have an impact on taxpayers, we have not, that is not a number that can be calculated because the impact on each taxpayer could be very different depending on which municipality they live in with our 14 different municipalities, as well as if there were reassessments and things of that nature. So there's not a mill rate calculation that we've done that uh, we would say at that point, it's budget neutral. But will a 7.49 mill rate result in an overall tax increase? Again, I can't confirm that based on the factors outside of our control. I am surprised by your answer, but the it seems to me so last year you added nine hundred and sixteen thousand eight hundred and forty dollars to the fund balance, which brings your surplus up to about twenty four percent twenty three point six or something. So that's just extra money you got sitting there. Now I understand the cash flow issue. But the board has a policy, um, a written policy of maintaining a fund balance of at least 15%. And that fund balance has gone up every single year for the last four years. You've had about a million dollars left over just to go into that fund. And it seems to me that at some point, enough is enough. You know, school districts are a taxing entity. You're not a manufacturer. You don't manufacture a widget and then make a profit and then spend your profits. You know, you're not a farmer. You don't put crops in the ground and grow them and make a profit. As a taxing entity, the only way you get money is you take it from people. That's what a taxing entity is. So these surpluses that you're building, you are getting them by overtaxing people and taking too much money, more than you need. A surplus by definition was more than you needed. So you had the $916,840 that went into the regular surplus. Then you had another two and a half million of surplus from, or 2.8 million from the levy. So 900 plus 2.8, you took an extra $3.7 million last year. Now, you use the excess to pay the debt, which was better than it sitting in a banking account. But when the citizenry voted to build Herman Elementary, they did it on the basis that you were going to take X amount out over 20 years to pay that off. They didn't vote for you guys to double or triple that and pay that debt off in six or seven years and overtax the people. We're facing the worst inflation in 40 years. Food prices on some categories are up 30%, sometimes more. Gas prices have almost doubled. People are going into the winter heating se season facing astronomical increases in propane, natural gas, and fuel oil. Senior citizens, Joe Paycheck, those people are hurting and you're overtaxing them. You, you could, would be okay at a 6.13 mil rate. That was your own number. And, but you want to, you're, in my opinion, you're being greedy and overtaxing at a 7.49 rate and paying off debt early 
And then when you pay off the debt, you're gonna come with a whole new big building project or renovation project. I think it's time to care about our senior citizens and our, our Joe pay, what I call Joe paycheck, the waitresses, the factory workers, the people that can't control their income. They're hurting. I talked to senior citizens that are barely making ends meet right now. And there's no money left at the end of the month because of the inflation. And that's the only reason those valuations are up that you're taking advantage of is because of inflation. People need real tax relief. And the school board, you know, so last year it was $3.7 million in surplus. This year on the levy, you're projecting 5 million, is that right? You're gonna take another, another million, two and a half million more on the levy. So you're taking an extra two and a half million this year when last year you had a $3.7 million surplus. Why does, this, why does a taxing entity need to take that money from the people? It's the people's money and we're in unprecedented times. 40 year high on inflation. This hasn't happened for 40 years. And I think you need to treat the taxpayers right. I mean, you have, you have the power, seven of you have the power to take more money, take an extra two and a half million from taxpayers on top of the 3.7 million surplus from last year. But you seven people need to think about that and what you're doing to people. I'll add just two more little anecdotal things. So I have some, I have a relationship with one of the food pantries in town, the economic or the ecumenical food pantry. And it's devastating the increase in numbers of families with lots of kids and senior citizens that are coming in there. It's an emergency food pantry, but they can't afford groceries. I know one night last week, 26 families came in to get food relief. And that's happening day after day after day. The Amish have a meat sale up in Ontario. They buy up meat that's about to expire. They freeze it so it doesn't rot. And then they bring in a semi and they sell it to people at a, at a decent price because it was, you know, would have been expired if it hadn't been frozen. I think you'd be shocked at the number of senior citizens that have to drive to places like that and buy things like almost expired meat. And then they go over to the Amish grocery store that sells food that's past its expiration date. And they have to buy food there because they can't afford regular groceries. That's what's going on in this school district. And it's time that we look at what we're doing to our citizens, what the school board's doing to the citizens, because you seven people get to make that decision. And I think you should give them real tax relief and that you should propose a levy of 6.13. Thank you, Mr. Asher. We appreciate your input. Ms. Weber, did you have any question or comment or did you just come down to here easier? Um, no, I wanted to be Absolutely. Okay, come on up. You're good to go. Thank you. The floor is yours. So I'm Stacy Weber. Um, uh, first of all, Gary, I agree with much of what you're saying. Um, the, the thing that surprised me the most in looking at this budget proposal was that extra payment of debt. And I feel the same way. I, I voted to build Herman Elementary. I took responsibility for that. But that debt was planned to be paid off at a certain rate. And paying it off at $4.7 million more than required just this year do we know what the impact is on the taxpayer because of just that amount? Yes. On page 35, the mill rate attributable to the debt payment is $4.25, um, which includes both the required 
debt payment as well as the debt defeasance. Exactly. Do you have those broken out? Do we know what our actual required payment would be on the mill rate versus that 425 with the extra payment? Uh, give me a moment, please. Okay. It's getting to the same question that, that Mr. Asher was bringing up. Um, you know, we did, uh, the voters did make a commitment to paying that off, but, and it's the rate at which that we're, we're being expected to pay that off that is the question. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask about was, uh, actually, if you'll, if you'll allow me, I have two other things. Um, I saw that the SBLA is funded out of the ESSER funds. How many students is SBLA currently serving? Right, about 50, five zero. All right. And so when the ESSER funds run out, what happens? How do we finance SBLA once ESSER funds are gone? I thought we, because I thought that the ESSER funds were trying to be used for like special pandemic related expenses versus ongoing budgeted items. With all of our ESSER funding, we're going to have to look at which ones are going to be, because we have ESSER funding that is limited. And in the end of the 23 24 school year, that ESSER funding will be out. And therefore, we're, we're actually beginning after very soon talking about what's going to happen with all of our programs that are inv involving ESSER and how do we move them to Fund 10? Do they dissolve? Um, we haven't begun those sorts of discussions as of yet formally. All right. All right. We're just making a commitment to keep SVLA open using temporary ESSER funds. Correct. Right now, SVLA is used with ESSER funds. All right. Um, all right. And then my the final thing I was wondering about is in the fund ten, there are the uh, non in the under non program transactions, the inter fund transfers um, budget of four point six. Is that broken out somewhere? Can we? That is one hundred percent to fund twenty seven or to support our special education programming. Okay, so it's that entire amount is the fund 27. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then I also have the figure for you. So the amount of debt defeasance that this budget is showing as an increase from last year is a $1.9 million increase. And that would equate to approximately a dollar fifteen in mill rate. That's the increase over last year, but that's not the amount that's attributable to the to the 2.2 required so the, debt payments versus the extra debt payments yep. is what I'm trying to separate. So the six dollar and thirteen cent mill rate that was discussed at the workshop included the defeasance at the same level that we did last year. And what was that? So what was that level? That was above the required amount as well. Correct. So what would that amount be if we only paid the required amount? I have it. And again, this is all approximate because we don't know our final figures till the 15. Um, So the dollar thirty six is accurate. Uh, as I mentioned, we continue to learn more information through September and October. When we had that financial workshop, we didn't have our people count completed yet for this year. So the fund 10 levy amount has changed based off of our pupil count. Um, so I just want to clarify the numbers that the workshop have changed because of our current student count. But to go back to your question, Ms. Weber, uh, $1.36 equates to our 2.2 .2 million required debt payment. All right, so $1.36 versus the $4.25. That is correct. On page 35. Correct. All right, that's a pretty big difference. And I guess that's philosophically, I mean, the thing that I want you to hear is that 
prepaying debt in a time when you have a better interest rate than anyone else has does not make any sense. Let's pay the debt down at the lowest rate that we need to do it, the rate that the taxpayers actually agreed to, and allow the rest of that money to be a, a taxpayer relief in this time. Thank you so much, Ms. Weber. Yeah. At this time, any other questions? Please go ahead. Uh, state your name and... Yeah, my name is Gordon Dace. Um, say, I'm wondering how many uh, teachers and teachers' aides do we have right now? I missed, I don't know if I saw it or I didn't. I don't have that right off the top of my head, but total staff, I believe we're about 430 total staff that is certified, classified, yes. and administration. Yeah. Online, it said 432 total staff. It said 228 teachers. Okay. It says, uh, uh, that our student teacher ratio is 12.72 per teacher. Um, the state average is 130. We're over, we're nearly a hundred teachers more than a, than the state average. The national average is 1.79. I'm asking why when our, uh, when our test scores are at in the 30 percentile range for math and 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 English and language, and I, and I'm wondering why that stuff is never talked about at school board meetings. Um, number eight, point number eight in our in, on your school website says their goal. Our goal number eight point eight, we will hold higher expectations for students' achievement when we're running at. 30% of grade school average, that isn't expecting very much. That's low bar. So and we've been at that point of 30% for 10 years at least. No change. My question goes along with these guys. Why are we spending this money? Why are, why are you hurting us? I, I teach in industry. I teach in industry. Last week, I had a student in his 30s who didn't know how to borrow. I'm talking about thousandths of an inch, plus or minus tolerance of five thousandths of an inch. This poor fellow cannot, does not know how to borrow. Next week, I'm teaching fractions so they can read a ruler. What are we doing as a school? On top of that, the pamphlet that you sent out, very warm and fuzzy. And I look at this uh, thing down here in the corner, portrait of a, of a Spartan, and I'm looking at the, 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 there's nothing on there that's measurable. Can we get something that's measurable so we can see how we're doing, right? Isn't, isn't that, you're an industry, what, I mean, what in the world are we doing? We, we put warm, fuzzy stuff on here. Everybody feels good. We got a, a new, nice football field and, uh, but our students are at 30 percentile range. Very frustrating. I, I'm an old guy. I got nobody in the school system, but, but I probably should thank you for job security for me because I'm going to industry and trying to fix what you guys are passing out as quality students. It's ridiculous. Thanks. Thank you very much for the time. Come on up, go ahead and state your name. Good evening, my name is Alice Ackerman. I'm here as a private person though, because I am a county employee. And I guess to address everyone, thank you much. I'd like to comment or questions I'd like to bring up on the community services funds. Um, really surprised to see it go from $20,000 to half a million dollars. Um, we have been a resident of the Sparta School District for four years now. I didn't even know there was a swimming pool in the district. Um, softball leagues, some of this stuff, really, it's taking a half a million dollars for that. Elderly food service programs. There are an incredible number of food service programs available already. If you're not aware of what they are, and if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them after the meeting if I'm still here. 
There's a lot of programs available already through the state and federal government. Why is the school district duplicating them? I was on my phone looking at what is the parenting place? It's the school district's responsibility to teach parents how to parent their children now? How many times do we need to do after school? When are parents gonna be able to parent their children? Because now they're supposed to bring them here for breakfast. You don't feed them lunch. And then they're after school as well. Um, I just have some real questions on that. Is that the best utilization of our funding in a short time frame or a, a period of economic recession? We're in a recession. It troubles me when I see the school board, and this was, I think, at the September meeting or last year, the uh, middle school gym needed to be refinished, which is an absolute vital thing that needed to be done. But if there was money left over in the budget, you guys were going to pay somebody to laser etch in the logo. Why? I mean, that to me is a clear thing of what your art teacher should be doing with your eighth grade students. Strip the floor, varnish it where it needs to have the, the sealant on it and before the final coats go on, let the kids paint it. I'm sorry, I was never in art, but I still vividly remember going down the science hall when my friend was painting a mural, had a frog, and I got to paint the top of the frog because I didn't need to get on a ladder. Thank you. Um, that's the kind of stuff that we should be doing and teaching kids how fun it can be with these things. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any further questions or comments? Mr. Hendricks, please. Please state your name. John Hendricks, and Thank I'm you. speaking as an individual. I, I just want to clarify a couple of points that have been brought up. One is, um, Ms. Hauser, it is, is it correct that actually the fund balance in the projected budget is going down? Is that correct? Yes, because we're using the revenue stabilization. Okay, and, and I'm supportive of the extra payment for debt to feasance. Um, the $4.7 million is a, a lot, a lot of money. There's no mm -hmm. doubt about it. But would you help us to understand how much of that $4.7 million is coming back to the district in the form of shared costs? Yes. So the way that our state funding works is the more state aid we receive, the less our tax levy is to support our general operations. When we prepay debt, that is considered part of that shared cost calculation, meaning we get state aid and that payment the following year. Conservatively, it would be a 42% reimbursement at our current reimbursement rate. And I say conservatively because we get reimbursed at three different tiers. And so we're budgeting that that reimbursement would be at the lowest tier of just over 40%. So that means 40 cents on the dollar that we spend on our operations and on debt payments, we get back in state aid the following year. And so if we decrease our payment on, on debt or operations this year, it decreases the amount of state aid we get next year, thus increasing the amount we need to levy to support our general operations. So we're taking, an, taking advantage of high reimbursement, plus by reducing that amount, we will hurt our budget impact next year. Correct. We would have a negative impact the following year. And then I also want to uh, bring up a point regarding uh, ratio of students to teachers. Uh, yes, in the DPI statistics that I have available to me, uh, we have a ratio of 11.08 students uh, per licensed staff. But if we look at comparisons around us, the Holman School District is 11.14, uh, Black River Falls is 11.9. Uh, so we're not um, out of the ballpark as far as our ratio of students to, to staff. And then lastly, I want to make sure people understand we have nothing to do with the, the city pool. We have nothing to do with the um, softball leagues. We have nothing to do with those types of things. And the fact that our community service budget is going up is not a reflection of additional programming or additional uh, well, additional programs that we're starting and all that is it's simply a shift of 
where that money is coming from. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And I apologize. Um, I understand where the misunderstanding came from with community service. Uh, I provided examples per DPI of how that fund could be used. That is not how we're using that fund on pool and things. Those are the options available. So each fund I provided the explanation for what that fund could do. That doesn't mean we're doing everything that's available. So that was in the effort to be transparent of the types of things we could cover with that fund. And I apologize if that caused confusion. So just as a quick recap, we have $20,000 to the parenting place, $500,000 for our win after school program, uh, which we moved to fund 80 last year that used to be completely supported by our $750,000 operating referendum. And then for this year, uh, we are adding the middle school co-curriculars is the proposal. Thank you so much, Mr. Hendricks. Please go ahead and state your name and then the floor is yours. My name is Dan Stone. Um, and before my question, I'd like to address Mr. Hendricks. Hey, Dan, real, real quick. Do you have a green light on I your microphone? Okay, light. just wanted to make sure. Go ahead and speak right into that microphone. Um, I wanted to address a, a comment Mr. Hendricks made on the uh, the loss of gained revenue next year because we're not paying off this excess loan. So uh, we plan on paying this loan off at what a 20 year rate and we're gonna pay it off in four or five. So now what happens at the end of five years when we have this massive drop, instead of a gradual drop at the end, like it was intended. Now, where do we make up this 42% of all this money? That's my first question. My question brought up um, while I was sitting waiting. So, so how do we stop this cliff that's gonna come at the end? It's gonna drop no matter what we do. It's a matter, do we want it to drop a little bit at the end or do we want this big, huge cliff at the end? Cause it has to drop. So the school board would have to determine you know, a possible operating or possible referendum, but that would be up to the school board to have discussions with about uh, if they allow that drop. And you're right, once the debt falls off, the, the, the mill rate will drop. And a lot of school districts do not like that big drop. They like the, the steady or maybe a little decline or increase because it, the, the taxpayers relatively will know what their mill rate would be rather than one year and then right and, and, and right down. So the school board at that time would need to make that decision. And then I would also like to state that other school districts, poor management should not be a be a model for us to follow. We shouldn't strive to have a high mill rate like, like other school districts do. But my original point that, that brought me up here that I wanted to ask a question about is, is at the end of last year, school year, from my understanding, what I got here is we had a $660,000 transfer from fund 10 into, into fund 46. Is that correct? That's the numbers that were given during the meeting here, $660,000 were transferred from fund 10 to, to fund 46. Mm -hmm. and, that, and now we're begging a mill rate for $560,000 that was already put into, a, in, into fund 46 that now we can't touch for operating costs, but we could before it was transferred. Why was it transferred in the first place? <clears throat> Uh, so you're referring to the transfer to fund 40? I'm referring to the $660,000 was taken at the end of last school year that was in excess of funds and it was transferred into fund 46 to go to a football field that we really don't need in the first place, which is overkill in any high school of the, in any town of this size. But we took into, we transferred $660,000 to build a high school a football stadium. And now we're begging $560,000 to operate the school. Why? So the transfer to Fund 46 that happens at the end of the school year right. is uh, really right. we have the choices of leaving it in fund balance or in equity to use for general operations the following year. You are right. correct. Right. The, but we opted the way not to do that. The way that the state funding model works is if we do that, we don't receive any state aid on that money, meaning right at, it would, 40, at, at what percentage? If you, if you could let Ms. Hauser respond, yeah, and then you'll get a chance to, to speak again. Meaning it would negatively impact our, our funding formula the following year. That doesn't mean it's bad to add to fund balance, but uh, 
How there's much would, how much would that have affected it? So we transferred a fund forty six because when we transfer no, that money, that, it's, leaving the six hundred thousand dollars. Could you please, yeah, yeah let, how much would I, that affect if you could let her answer the year? question, that'd be great. So we transfer money to fund forty six uh -huh. uh, for twofold. One, the six hundred and sixty thousand dollar transfer was not for Memorial Field. It actually was, we knew we'd have some budget concerns this year. And we had some capital projects on our long range plan that needed to be addressed, such as the uh, heating and cooling at the high school. And so that transfer was made last year to cover those costs in this year's budget. So it was uh, maintenance projects that were scheduled for this year. And the benefit to making that transfer to Fund 46 is we can use those funds to pay for those projects this year, and we receive state aid on that transfer. Where if we left it in fund balance to pay for those same projects, we would not have received state aid last year. Precisely. So it was an effort to help with the mill rate this year, as well as meet our needs. Precisely how much state aid would you receive on that money? Yep, that would be the approximately 42%. Approximately forty-two percent. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't have my calculator with me. Yeah, approximately two hundred seventy-seven thousand. Thank you, sir. All right. Further questions or comments, Mr. Asher? The floor is yours. Thank you. Again, I noticed that the speaker just before that gentleman turned and faced the crowd. Thank you so much for that. Maybe next year is a suggestion, you know, you could position this off to the side or something so that we're speaking to the people and to you. So it's not like a personal attack on you all that we're talking to everybody. I think that's a little more friendly. We did talk about that. Yeah, we went back and forth of how we wanted to do it. Yeah, so that, that's fine. Thank strongly you. Strongly recommend that. Um, you know, the financial statement, the audited statement's not done and the fiscal year ended June 30. I'd strongly recommend that, that you have, that you force your auditors who you're paying a lot of money to, to have that cotton picking statement available before the annual meeting so that we know that we're talking about real. I think uh, Ms. Hauser's a, a, a great business person. I'm sure all of her numbers were accurate and that the audit is a formality but that way we know that the final audited figures are what they are. Um, and then I, I have a procedural question. So like we've, we've talked about the fund balance and how it's up around 24% and how the, the board has a written policy to make that be at least 15%. And now it's up to 24, it's increased every year. And, um, how is, do you just take public comment into consideration? Can, can someone make a motion at this? Because I, I realize nothing here is binding and it's all advisory, but can a motion be made that the board adopt a policy to cap the fund balance at a certain percent? That's my first question. That would be a discussion for the Board of Education and public input would be the appropriate time. The the setting of the fund balance percent uh, is not a power of the annual meeting. Okay. And then as far as the levy goes, do we just vote yes or no on your 7.49 or can the citizenry propose a different levy to vote on? If, as long as we get a motion in a second, that would go to a vote. So it is not, it is just for discussion purposes. The Board of Education said, we're gonna put $7.49 on our slides for discussion purposes, but that is not binding that. So anyone can make a motion to uh, set the mill rate at X. So anyone can do that. Okay. Um, to summarize what I said earlier, 3.7 million surplus last year, gonna go up another 2.5 million, over 10 million in, in the general fund as a surplus, 2.2 uh, .2 million in ESSER three funds, uh, money left over from building Herman Middle School, uh, how many hundreds of thousands of dollars is that? Um, school district has a lot of cash on hand and 
is it appropriate for me to make a motion about the levy now or not? Not at this time. We're still okay. in the hearing portion. Okay, that's fine then. Thank you, sir. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Asher. Any for Mr. Dace, go for it. Yeah, I have to. I have to give it to you. Uh, last year we had a referendum that failed, and uh, this year we've learned how to hide it in the budget here and and the levy. And uh, I have to give that to you. Um, it looks pretty nice on the film here on the on the projector that uh, the levy is going to change, and it's going to be less than it was last time. However, John makes a great point here. Our, our houses are getting more uh, valuable and that's really gonna end up with a raise for us. And again, you have to remember, uh, when we talk about uh, making $42,000 million or whatever, 42,000, I don't know what the percent was, but who's paying that money originally? That's not the school, that's the people. So we're paying it and you're gaining the 42% interest. That's, we're not interested in that. The other gentleman there um, says we would like that gradual uh, decrease in the value, in the paying off our bills. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Dace. Was there any further comment questions? I saw you had stepped down here. Yeah. So if you could just state your name and then the, the podium is yours. Hi there. My name is Tim Ackerman. Um, I just had a couple of Quick questions. Um, the first is, what's the what's the starting salary per teacher? It's approximately a little over forty one thousand. So forty one thousand. Does that include benefits, or is that just straight salary? Straight salary. And what is the uh, additional uh, benefit cost? It varies from family to individual plans, and some people do not take either one of them. Ms. Hauser may know more about that. Roughly 20,000 if they take the full benefits package. So if they take the entire benefits package is 20,000. 20 to, yeah. Okay. And that, uh, and that just varies with whether you're a single individual or if you are a family, correct? Correct. As far as the, like the total. Yeah, 20,000 would be on the low end, but okay. for sake of discussion. So, um, and then I see here you have two different retirement plans. Uh, down at the bottom, the TSA 403B retirement plan, and and the district pays fifteen hundred dollars for that. Towards yep. that, and then the employee pays fifty dollars towards that. So that's the only district sponsored retirement plan. And for an employee to be eligible for the district contribution, they have to contribute fifty dollars. The other retirement plan you're referencing is the state reti retirement plan, which the state dictates the rate and being a public service employer, uh, we're obligated to participate in that program. Okay, I'm, I'm fine with the, the second one. But my question is, it says we have uh, a member benefit. Um, so in order to take advantage of that, you have to be a member of WEA? No. No? Well, uh, so I want to make the, sure our acronyms are correct. So there are different organizations in the state that have WEA as part of their name. Uh, WEA, in this case, is a service provider who oversees retirement plans. They have, uh, it's basically an insurance provider. Okay. So... I, I guess now I'm more confused than what I was on this. We're, uh, you know, six and a half percent by the district and six and a half percent by the employee. You know, that's that's pretty standard. Uh, you go out in the real world, and you know, it's pretty much the same thing. Might be a little higher as far as the district is concerned than most employers um, are willing to contribute uh, to an employee's retirement plan by about 3%, um, but this, I, I don't understand, is this uh, the TSA 403B retirement plan? Is that open to all teachers and they just choose not to take part of it or they take part of it? 
uh, take part in it. I it's say. largely available to all. If somebody works a very due schedule, it may not be available, but for the most part, available to all. Um, I do want to comment that it's subject to a vesting schedule. So if a employee leaves before nine years of service, they don't get any of the district contribution. It forfeits back to the district between nine and 14 years. They only get 50%. So they have to be a long-term employee 15 or more years before they receive that whole benefit. Okay. So, but we're contributing $1,500 per employee, mm -hmm. correct? And they're contributing 3%? Isn't fifty dollars three percent of the fifteen hundred? Yep, it's a flat. So $50. in order, so we're giving them an extra ninety-seven percent, then and they're they're doing three. That's a minimum Correct. that they need to be involved. I, mean, I don't know the portion of more staff who okay. put more than that in, but they get to they get to put in fifty dollars, and then we put in the extra, and then if they leave before, which Miss Hauser said. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm well aware of that, but we're yep. talking about an extra fifteen hundred dollars here, or fourteen hundred and fifty dollars that we're giving to these people. Correct. Well, we're investing Correct. fifteen hundred dollars per okay. staff above, member. Yes, above the 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 extra three percent that we're typically giving them for a retirement plan over what um, me as a as a private citizen gets. Um, most of the companies that I work for over time, um, you were maxed out at 3% of at what the employer would give you. And I think that's still fairly current today. I could be wrong, um, but for an employee match, um, and is the insurance put out for bid every year? Uh not every year. We have a insurance committee um, that meets every year and reviews the plan and reviews the data and the trends and then make a rec makes a recommendation to the Board of Education. I would say typically it's about every third year. Why? With the changing costs that we have in the medical field, um, why are we waiting so long? I mean, it, obviously with the last change, you managed to save quite a little bit of money. So why isn't it not done on a yearly basis? You can have the same plan features, but just, and, and the a subsequent question to that is, how many insurance agencies do you put out the bid to? Is it one or two? Uh, I know back in the day, you had to get it from um, WIA before, the, before Walker came in and changed that. Um, and so, they could charge whatever they wanted to. Um, so how many different companies are we saying, hey, we got some great employees here. We got a lot of we're school, we got good funding. Yep, so what we put it out on the marketplace. Um, there's maybe about six uh, big providers who really specialize in school districts and then whoever wants to but it's not limited to them. And then whoever is interested in submitting a proposal is welcome okay. to. And then the, the last question that I have on that is, is the lowest bid taken or the, the services provided? I mean, we, we want to provide mm -hmm. good benefits for our, our teachers. Mm -hmm. There's no question about that. But my question is, are we taking a, um, four years ago, I know for a fact that um, uh, in the, um, on Alaska School District, they did not take the low bid, even though it provided the same amount of services. Mm -hmm. are, is that what we're doing as well? Or are we taking the low bid for all the services provided? Um, I would say that's through the work of the committee. And so usually it's more of a the low bid, but also looking at the plan design. So we saw, for instance, um, a cost savings this year, we switched providers and we redesigned the plan. So we changed some of the benefits. And so all of those pieces together equaled the change that we're seeing. Um, why we don't go out annually, uh, it's not to say what, that we couldn't, but to get the most advantageous pricing, a lot of times being able to say that 
uh, and not that we confirm, you know, uh, commit to say a two or three or four year renewal, but a lot of times there's um, pricing protection. So it, there's no board policy that says it'll be annually or every three years or whatnot. It's through the work of the committee. Okay. Thank you for, mm -hmm. for that. Uh, so we have a, a situation now where we have, as stated prior, we have the worst inflation in 40 years. If you've been to the grocery store and I do the shopping in the house, I can tell you the can of peaches that used to cost 89 cents is now $1.59. I can tell you that um, a steak that used to cost me two years ago, $6.99, is now $15. And you're asking us to, with the cost of housing having gone up. So your mill rate is, so what you're going to already get has gone up because the quote unquote fair market price of homes has gone up on the average in this area, 14.2%. So you're going to get a 14.2% increase and yet you're gonna, Jack, the mill rate up to, or the, uh, you're, you're instead of the initial number of six something, you're going to now seven? Yep. So you are correct. The equalized values play a role in decreasing the mill rate. So we presented both the total tax levy and the mill rate for that okay. exact yep. reason. And so the total tax levy on page 34, um, we're looking at a total increase to the tax levy of just over half a million. So $522,970. And, and, and that's not including, that's not including the fact that all of your homes, if you own them, or borrowing them from the bank, actually, um, all of those are going to go up this year. So not only are you going to pay more for that, but your it, and then we're paying down the debt faster than we have to, so that we fall off the cliff sooner than what we have to. It just it doesn't make any sense to me why we why we do this. Yes, you say we get more state aid, but at the same point, we now have an interest rate. You know what? Have you looked for a house lately? It's now over 6% on an interest rate and it's going up because inflation is, is going to continue to rise. So we're gonna see a return. Um, I'm old enough to have seen 14 and a half percent on a house interest rate, your car interest rate. And we're, we have the interest rates locked in at from three to five. And yet we're gonna pay that off faster so that at some point what we can do is reborrow a bunch of money at a much higher interest rate so that we can pay that off faster so that we can get more state aid. That doesn't make any sense to me at all. Thank you for your time. I appreciate your answers. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Wells, you came up. Did you have any a comment? All right. If you could just state your name into the microphone and then the podium is yours. Yeah, uh, my name is Todd Wells, and I'm uh, Joe Paycheck. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, just uh, point out an idea that was brought up here. Uh, so uh, fund balance, is it true that a healthy fund balance uh, improves our bond rating? Yes, that is true. So would you say that could save the taxpayer money in the long term if we had a healthier fund balance on, uh, if we were to... Uh, take out issue loans? In theory, yes. Okay. And then uh, just to uh, clarify, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but uh, with the amount of debt that the Board of Education has paid down, how much in interest payments have we saved? Good question. Um... 
I don't know that I can tell you that off of the top of my head, but I can bring that to the full board meeting on the 25th and I can share it ahead of time mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, yeah. But uh, we, it's been over millions of dollars, but I couldn't tell you the exact amount. So uh, we spend a few million, but then we get a few million back in state equalization aid. And then we also save a few million in interest payments, correct? If you give me one second, I'll be able to tell you the proposed interest savings and the 749 mill rate. Uh, just one second. Okay, our financial advisor projected the following based on uh, that 749 mill rate. And again, this is subject to change just a little bit once we get our final numbers on October 15th. Uh, the savings and interest cost over the remaining life of the loan for the prepayment would be $2.3 million. The additional state aid that it would generate next year is just shy of $2.2 million. All righty, sounds good. Thank um, you. Yeah, uh, so over the long term, I, I agree that this is the best option. Um, I would say, uh, since I've lived here for more than 20 years and plan on, and I know a lot of people that plan on living here for longer than 20 years, I can absolutely see a benefit in doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wells. I appreciate your time. Did you have something? All right. If you could just state your name and then go ahead and the podium is yours. Hi, my name is Josh Matheson. Thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, Todd, great questions. That's kind of where my head was going to. Um, one of the questions I have is, um, does the reimbursement we get depend on whether it's a principal or interest payment? Or is it, or is the total payment calculated at? The total payment. Okay. And then, um, is there a resource you have to find what the factors are that make up that forty-two percent reimbursement? If it could be higher, it could be lower for each school district. Yep, that's um, set each year uh, through the state aid calculation. So, in essence. Hopefully I'm not getting too off subject, but I think what you're asking is, so the state sets aside a bucket of money to distribute to all the school districts in the state. So if you consider that like a pie yep. and then each district's state aid reimbursement is a slice of that pie. So um, the factors, again, that contribute to state aid are enrollment and how much we spent the previous year. And so the state right now is collecting all that data from all of the districts to determine the slice of pie each district gets. And that's what we're receiving October 15th. So we know based on historical about where we'll land, but we won't know that for sure until basically the state's accumulating all the audit data and enrollment data and calculating that number right now. So we're anticipating it'll be about 42%, but it could fluctuate a little bit. Are there certain factors that the school district can do to improve that reimbursement or, or yep. opposite? Yep. So we monitor our spending because um, I'm just going to throw out some hypothetical numbers. If we spend at $40 million this year, our state aid is based on that $40 million. Then if next year we spend $36 million, we know our state aid will go down because it's a factor of how much we spend. So we try to keep our spending about equal to make sure that we don't have that dip in state aid, because when we have that dip in state aid, the tax levy automatically increase, increases because it's that inverse relationship. So state aid and tax levy, as one goes up, the other goes down and vice versa. Sure. Um, and I don't recall the referendum, my last question. Uh, I don't recall the referendum. How was that presented? Was it 
and these are the set terms or was there flexibility in the terminology to pay it off early? Is that something that's uh, discussed by the uh, school board to figure that out on a year to year basis? Mm -hmm. um, so how it was presented and we're talking about the facility referendum just right. to make sure we're all on the same page is that it wouldn't increase the mill rate by more than 39 cents. And we've actually had our mill rate decrease each year since approval of that referendum. Okay. So it was communicated on a mill rate impact. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Matheson. Appreciate it. Um, I, I think, well, I don't know which one of you was first, but yeah, feel free. That's fine. All right, go ahead. Come on up. Yep. Sorry, in the hat. Just uh, give your name and then the podium is yours. Hi, I am Donna Peterson. Um, I really want our kids to succeed. That is the priority of any school system. Um, Thank you, Mrs. Lopez. Um, right now, you're showing a deficit of the revenue. How do you expect to increase that? Thank you. The only way that we can increase our operating referendum outside of the revenue limit is through an operating referendum. So our operating revenue is really capped, the majority of it, at the state level. So we can... Um, Basically, if the state funding formula changes, that would change our revenue, the state and federal grants that we receive, and then the only other option is through an operating referendum. So you're asking us to do another referendum? No, not okay, tonight. I'm no. not understanding it. No. Where does it come from? Yep. So this year, that's why our fund balance is important, is that we're using over $500,000 of fund balance because we do have a revenue shortfall this year. Okay. Um, this year, you're under budget, and past years, you've been over budget. I'm sorry, are you referring to for where we end? ended the 21-22 year or what we're projecting for this? Well, let's coming? say the last five years. Okay. Uh, we have not ended under budget in the past five years. Yeah. And where did that money go? Yep. Um, so our fund balance by a dollar amount has grown because it's um, the board policy is a percent of expenses and our expenses continue to grow. So when you look at inflation and cost of living and salary increases, our expenses grow each year. And so as our expenses grow, the dollars and our fund balance need to grow as well. Uh, we typically maintain a 19 to 20% fund balance. So although board policy is 15%, uh, going back many years, we've never been that low because we know we need to be closer to 19 to 20% in order to meet our bills. And to dig a little deeper into that, the reason why is remember 80% of our funding is state aid and the tax levy. And that comes in at very specific times throughout the year. But our largest expense is payroll, which happens every two weeks. So there's months out of the year that we have no revenue coming in and we still have payroll going out, which is why fund balance is so important. And we have seen over time that that 19 to 20% fund balance is really where we need to be in order to keep our cash flow throughout the year. Um, so going back to why we're up in the 23% range now, it's because of the budget uncertainty, uncertainty. So that's evidenced this year in that we're using over a half million of our fund balance to meet our general operations. So that's the rationale behind it. Did I answer the pieces of your question there? Well, it is very confusing, the whole thing yeah. I have to study. <laughs> it is. And I don't have an accounting degree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think the citizens are asking you to keep it budgeted. Mm -hmm. Stick to the budget. Um, I see you're still hiring. 
I saw a sign as I came in. What, what are you hiring for? We're hiring for substitutes. We're hiring for bus drivers. And we're hiring for after school, after and before school programs for when. Okay, you're that short. Y yes, we have it for our after school programs. Uh, we have a waiting list and it's it's not because of space, lack of space, it's because we cannot find the workers. Waiting list in the hundreds. So that's we're, we're trying to find the best we can to serve our community, but the best we can as well. And we do have, I'm not gonna say we don't have, you know, we had an educational assistant and a health aide resign recently, but for the most part, we're looking for bus drivers, substitute teachers in all positions and our after and before school programs. Okay, it, it is my opinion that it's heavy with administration here. Um, and that would be a way of cutting the budget. So thank you so much for your input, thank Mrs. You. Peterson. Uh, all I have is Tim written down. I didn't have your last name. I really apologize, but you're you're welcome to come on up again. All right. The podium is yours. Just, just had just one, one absolutely simple question, Tim Ackerman. Um, so with us paying down the debt at the rate that we're extra paying it down so that we're going to get to that cliff fall off much sooner, isn't that going to then lead us to have to borrow? Because I have yet to see a school district that at some point, uh, typically more often than not, every several years asks for a, a rate increase or, or more money for X, Y, and Z. So instead of paying that off sooner so we get to the cliff sooner so we don't get the state aid anymore and we're going to have to fund that some other way at a much higher interest rate than what we're currently paying why don't we take that money that we are paying down the debt with which saves us 2.3 million dollars over the years but how much more is the next borrowing going to be because we're not going to get an interest rate from three and a half to five percent on this money ever again, unless you believe that the country is going to turn completely around in the next year. And it's not going to happen. Interest rates are going back up. They were kept artificially low for the last 20 years. You people that are as old as I am, you know what interest rates used to be. You now see we kept them artificially low for economic reasons, great. But the next borrowing that we're going to have to do is gonna be at a much higher rate. So in order to pay that off, we're going to have to increase our spending at the schools from the mill rate and everything, excuse me, and everything else. So I, do, I just don't see the wisdom in paying this off early. Let's add it to our fund, let's keep the money because interest rates are going up. And if you're investing the money in nothing else but simple interest, which I think is about all we're allowed to do with it, that's still going to increase our revenue that we have to spend on the projects that we're going to need to spend the money on further down the road. Because we all know that buildings don't last forever. We know that equipment breaks on a regular basis. We're going to need this money. And I can't see why we can't, instead of doing this, paying it off much sooner, which means when we come to borrow again, we're gonna to have to borrow at a much higher interest rate. It just doesn't make any sense to me because we're then we're talking about extra millions of dollars that we're gonna end up owing. Thank you, Mr. Ackerman, I appreciate it. Mr. Burnett, if you could just give your full name and then the podium is yours. Thank you, uh, Christopher Burnett. Uh, just a quick question regarding the state equalization aid. Is that a set amount, like regardless of how much any school district gets, it's like, this is the exact amount the state has. So whatever we don't get, another school district gets regardless, like we're not impacting what taxes would be for the state that's already been set. You are correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burnett, I appreciate it. Are there any further comments or questions? Uh, Mr. McKenna, please. If you could state your full name into the microphone and then the podium is yours. Yeah, you're gonna have to, yeah. <laughs> Pat McKenna. Um, first, I'm kind of a nerd. I've spent the last two weeks studying annual reports from other school districts in the area. Um, I've read all of our neighbors, multiple in the state. And I can tell you there isn't one that I read that's more transparent than this. 
I'm not saying I understand every line. I'm not Leah. And I doubt that anybody here is. But if you have a question about where something is or what it is, it's not hidden here. That doesn't mean that you necessarily are going to agree with the policy of debt defeasance and paying down debt. We're probably not going to sit here and come to an agreement that, hey, the mill rate should be exactly this or exactly that. When I look at this, compare it to our annual report last year, and compare it to the other districts in the area, the difference is astounding. I'm not sure I agree with $5.7 million of prepaid debt. I'm not sure I agree with that because what Gary said and what Stacy echoed, there's people in our community that are hurting for real. Mr. Ackerman, you're 100% right. We borrow money three years from now, we're not going to get it at 3% or 4% or 5%. My question has been through this process what's the plan? When we pay off a 20 year loan in six years, what are we going to do next? The other thing I noticed when I was reading all those annual reports, I paid real close attention to the percentage of state aid. Right now, for every dollar that the school district is spending, 15 cents of it is ours. If you go to West Salem, it's 37 cents. Go to La Crosse, it's 41. Home, it's 36. What that means is that Toma and West Salem and La Crosse are paying off Herman. We're getting back more in state aid than we're paying. This system is broken. I, I can't describe how bad it is for me to sit up here and think that I can't save money. We're not fixing that in this room. That's the state system. Our job is to function inside that system, do the best thing for the district and the best thing for our community. Mr. Asher, you mentioned 7.19 versus 7.49 being the, the balancing act where you thought that we wouldn't raise taxes. In a mill rate, 30 cents, Average house in Sparta now is 250,000 bucks, $75. Personally, I'll pay the 75 bucks. It makes no difference. If I don't pay it in taxes, I'll probably waste it on a new pair of tennis. There's people that matter to. Mr. Asher is 100% right. $75 might be weekly groceries for somebody. What we need to find here is a balancing act. It's about want versus need. I need to know that my money is being spent wisely. I need to know that my district has an eye on the future. When we pay this debt off, what next? We all know there's next. What's it gonna be? How's it gonna benefit our kids? I don't think I could in good faith, vote for 7.49. And I've really struggled with that number. I've kicked it around a lot of different times. But I also don't think it's to our advantage to lower the mill rate as much as we possibly can, or it's going to be an absolute rocket to the top next year because we're not going to get state aid. There's a balance in the middle. I think the middle is where we should be. Thank you, Mr. McKenna. Uh, and yeah, Mrs. Leverage, please. If you could just state your full name and then the podium is yours. Sure. Um, Marla Leverage. And I have to um, commend you and say again what Pat said about this booklet and being open and transparent. I'm, I'm really impressed. I, I think you did a really, really good job at trying to teach us the complexities of what goes into budgeting in a school system that's kind of crazy that you have to spend more money for us to get money you know that that to me is is ridiculous so if the other school districts aren't spending as much money that's why their percentage is higher i have a couple of questions 
Um, and these are particular questions. So on page um, 18 or 19 in the book, um, transfers in versus enrollment out in private school vouchers. So how much are we, how much are you, the school district spends out for um, transfers in versus open enrollment out versus private school vouchers? Uh, are those all, I mean, the open enrollment out and private school vouchers, are those expenses? I'm not even sure yep. where uh -huh. that is. So the private school voucher, you can actually see on page 28. And again, this is an estimate. This is one of the numbers we'll get October 15th. Last year, it was $685,983. Okay. So we're budgeting $690,000 with the actual amount to be determined. So that's your private school voucher program. And uh, that is all local tax dollars. That is not state aid. For open enrollment in and out, those do fall under the revenue limit. So that means that for the open enrollment out students, we get that $10,000 per student. And then we turn around and pay, um, it's about $8,300 per student to the district that they're okay. open enrolling to. Okay. Uh, so the number for the open enrollment in, so the kids who live elsewhere and are coming to Sparta, mm -hmm. that's line 340. And our budget for the revenue is $504,402. That's on the bottom of page 18. Okay. And then for expenses... It is line, I'm on page 21 towards the bottom, mm -hmm. line 430000. Yep. And the expense budget for this year is the 3.7 million. 3.7 million. And that is, is, is that's all yep. just open enrollment out, or does that include private school voucher? Also? That does not include private school vouchers. vouchers. Okay. Um, I believe private school vouchers, I'll have to confirm this, but I believe they're in line 290000. And okay. I'll verify that. Included in there. Okay. Um, all right. And then my other question is fund 80, which is our community service fund. Right now, we've got two different programs con taking money from that. Mm -hmm. A fund, right? The Parenting Place and the Win Boys and Girls Club. Well, which used to be a Boys and Girls Club program. So how many people are utilizing the 20,000 that goes into the Parenting Place? Do you know? I'm going to hand that one to Mr. Okay. All right. Um, just bear with me. Got some information later today. Um, we have for the parenting classes, we had 162 people registered. We had uh, magical Mondays. And I'm not 100% sure on what these, you know, all, I'm not going to pretend I'm a professional on those, but the parenting classes were 162. Uh, they had another program for 181 families. And then in uh, 2022, they had uh, for parent connections, they had 59 families as well. Along with, uh, there's a diaper bank that they also be a part of and 175 families requested. Okay, so are the classes outside of school? The classes are available to any community member. And okay. so it could be a, uh, a community member that's uh, for parenting or it could be a, a teenage parent, um, but it is um, for a student, we like them to be outside of school, but it really depends on everyone's schedule. Okay. But the classes are held outside of school hours, correct? Well, it depends. Like the, the 162 people who are enrolled in a parenting class, that's outside of school hours, correct? Well, I don't think it's necessary outside of school hours because they may not all be students. So they may have a parenting class at 9 a.m. 
that doesn't involve students. Remember, it's a community use. It's not just for students. Oh, so it's not held in the school. They, they have their offices are in uh, Maplewood. Okay. So they do have uh, some, some rooms in Maplewood where they put, where they have their programs there. Okay. All right. So, okay, maybe I'll chat with yep. you regarding Happy. details on that. Okay. Um, now I noticed that $500,000 is going for the wind program. Mm -hmm. um, correct me if I'm wrong, that used to be covered by a CLC grant, correct? A portion of it, yep. So we had CLC grants, but the largest portion of that cost was actually covered by the 750,000 operating referendum. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, and we, how much of it was, was covered with the Boys and Girls Club program? Because I thought yeah. it was run through the Boys and Girls Club. Um, just one second. Okay, so for ahead. the CLC grant, this year we have a CLC grant as well for the Herman building because they're really like startup grants. So since Herman was a new school, they qualified. So $100,000 this year is being paid for out of that grant. So the total program cost is actually $600,000 budget. Um, well, it's more than 600,000 because we're using some fund balance too, but regardless. Um, and then as far as the Boys and Girls Club, it's always been a district provided program. Basically, we partnered with the Boys and Girls Club for the staffing, but it's always been, uh, the cost has always been a district cost. The Boys and Girls Club, actually it was a revenue source for them because we were uh, paying them to provide services meaning the staffing. And now we do all the staffing in-house. So so was it always a such a huge amount of money going toward this after school program? I don't yeah. know if I remember that it was being set that being such a huge amount. Mm -hmm. It has definitely grown over time. Uh, so it started out at just uh, this is back when we had Lawrence Lawson and Southside and Maplewood. Um, it started out at those sites on a smaller scale, and uh, the demand for it has grown tremendously. Uh, so not only do we offer it at more of our sites, um, we offer it to more students. So we're serving, I don't know if you have that number, <laughs> for how many students. Uh, we've also expanded it to be in the morning in some of our locations. Um, so we're, we grow the program for what the demands are from our, from our community. And yes, that has grown over time. But that's, that's an elective, elective amount on your, in your budget. I mean, it's not a required um, program that needs to be given out at the schools, correct? That is correct. It's not a requirement. It's, uh, based on community desire. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Also, um, getting into the mill rate, because that's what we need to vote on and talk about and approve this tonight, all of us. Um, I did some calculations and, and um, I, I think that a mill rate of $7 and 49 cents is um, going to hurt our community way more than um, what it could be, what it could be. Um, you know that inflation is going up. Eggs, for instance, I just went to the quick trip. I used to get them for $1.99. They're now $3.49. That's a 75% increase. Um, our dollar store, which used to be everything for a dollar, is now $1.25. That's a 25% increase. Gas, I remember when it was 289, it's now 399. That's it, it goes up and down, but that's 30, 40 percent, and it's supposed to go even higher. So, our all of our expenses are going way up, way up. And, and this is not transitory, this inflation is here to stay, and everything and fuel costs are going to be continuing to go up, and the heating season is coming on, and it's just going to continue on through through the next year. And I think if we have the ability and the time, I mean, the, the ability to lower our mill rate at least for a, a year or two to get through this until we turn, this economy gets turned around. I think now is the time to do it. 
I, I, I do agree that we should pay down our debt, prepay, because we get 40 cents on the dollar, 42%, whatever, on the dollar for prepaying it. But I don't think that we should pay down $4.7 million of it. Um, I, here's what I'm going to throw out. Our equalized value in Sparta went um, up 15.6% as what was said in the book. What about if we um, take our mill rate from last year, 8.29, and decrease it 15%? That'll get, it, get, get us to a 705 mill rate. Or if, it, if you want around 15.6% to 16%, maybe we can get it down to $7 mill rate. So it's not the 6.13, it's not the 7.49, but it's somewhere in the middle. Then we'll be paying down our, prepaying our debt, increasing, I mean, we're still getting expenses so that next year we won't have this drop in state equalization aid. Um, it, it'll balance out so that we can have a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and we can get some, some relief on our tax bill, at least one thing might go down when everything else is going up. So I ask you if you could please think about that when we're voting on the um, proposed mill rate, because this, this is gonna affect us, but it's not only just gonna affect us that, that can't afford to pay it, it's gonna affect a lot of people who can't afford to pay it. And all those people who might not be sitting here in this auditorium, and think about, think about how it's gonna affect their bottom line. So that's what I'm gonna say. Thank, Thank you, you so much, um, Mrs. Leverage. And I do have clarification for you on the private school voucher. Okay. You were correct. Uh, line 430000 includes both open enrollment out and the private, private school, school voucher program. Yeah. So thank you for that. Open enrollment out, the budget is about 2.6 million. Okay. And then about 630,000 is for the voucher program. Okay. And then that equals or comes close to that 3.7 million. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope everybody here has felt uh, that they've been heard. They've had the opportunity to speak. Uh, I hope that you see that we've tried to be tr as transparent as possible. Mrs. Ha Ms. Hauser, thank you again so much for creating a, a book here that gives us uh, so much valuable information transparently to our constituents. For me, the understanding, uh, again, if you take a look at page 35, and we take a look at the mill rate over, since 2019 to 2020, at that point, the mill rate was at $9.20. The following year, we reduced by 9.6% down to $8.86 mill rate. Then the next year, we decreased the mill rate again by 9.3% to $8.29. That's what we dealt with last year. This year, again, we understand the cost of your home is, is the cost of a house has gone up 15.6%. We are looking at continuing the reduction and that's where the 749 came in was looking at a 9.6% decrease as compared to a 16% decrease. So over the last four years, we have a 9.6 decrease, 9.3 decrease, 9.6 decrease down to $7.49. By utilizing that, we're decreasing the mill rate by 80 cents. We are earning to almost $2.2 million in state aid next year directly for our students. And we're saving about $2.3 million in interest on the back end of this. So the focus is, we understand that inflation, with inflation, cost of living has gone up. We are providing a decrease as a school district. Okay, some people would like it to see 16%. I had somebody that wanted to see a 20% decrease. I completely understand that. The goal was to make sure that we didn't increase anything. So the Sparta Area School Board of Education has asked administration to present a total tax levy, then I would entertain a motion at the corresponding mill rate of $7.49. Oh, absolutely. Do you want to, please.
I was moving us into resolutions because everybody was done talking. Please okay. go ahead, Amy. Uh, full name, podium yes. is yours. My name is Amy Lopez, and I'm here speaking strictly as an individual. I want to commend the previous board for diffusing debt, for prepaying debt, because debt pre prepaying, diffusing the debt lowers our total debt. It saves us millions in interest. I think that this has been established. It provides a revenue source in state equalization aid. That state, state equalization aid then lowers the required tax levy to the community. That inverse relationship that Ms. Hauser was discussing. At 749, a mill rate of 749 increases the total tax collected from the local taxpayer by about $500,000. Is that correct, Ms. Hauser? It is, okay. 719 keeps the total tax collected by the district about the same as last year. Is that correct? I believe it's, let me see. I believe that 720 would be about an $11.8 million total tax levy at $8.3 million or mill rate last year, our tax levy was also 11.8 million. Sure, thank you. Okay, thank you, that's correct. So anything under 7.8, one nine as a mill rate would provide a tax relief to our community, show some sensitivity to the financial situation that they're in. But it would require, because we would lose some state equalization aid, it would require an increase in our mill rate, or rather I should say it would increase the amount required from our local community the following year. Okay. Again, I'm speaking as an individual. I think that in the future, we will have some needs in the district that we'll need to come to the community for. Lowering the total tax rate would be good. Keeping it the same would do no harm. Raising it may make it difficult in the future for the board to come to the community and say, we need to increase our operating expenses by transferring funds from one bucket to another, or we need an oper or a referendum rather for capital improvements. That's all I'd like to say. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lopez. Mr. Russ, I'm going to pass it over to you here for a second. So where are we at and how should we progress? Proceed. Well, I just want to make sure, is there anyone else that wishes to speak on the budget hearing? Thank you all for the comments. Remember that the, the, the Board of Education is all here and listening to your comments. And we, you know, from the superintendent level, I really appreciate those feedbacks. And if you do have questions, uh, a lot of was discussed here uh, that might not have the, the annual meeting authority, but if you do have questions about things outside of the annual meeting authority or even inside the annual meeting authority, please let me know and we can sit down and talk. So, um, but without any more public input on the hearing, I think we can move to the resolution. Uh, Mr. Asher, just one second here. We'll go ahead and go for it. So I called uh, under Robert's Rules of Order. I called for a point of order. It's a procedural question. Um, takes precedent. Uh, and I'm questioning at what point people in the audience get to make a, um, a resol propose a resolution. Can we do it now? Do we have to wait till the end? Because they're... Um, 
that might affect how different votes go. Yep. So at this time, for the point of order, if we would, if it's okay, Mr. Chairman, yeah, absolutely, that yeah. we would go to resolution A, which is recommending a mill rate to the Board of Education for the 22-23 school year. So now would be the time that any community member, any electric, I'm sorry, could make a motion to recommend to the board a mill rate for the following year. Okay, then I'm gonna take advantage of that. And um, <laughs> I'm going to uh, propose, I really think it should go to 6.13, but I'm gonna give a little ground, I'll listen to what Ms. Mrs. Leverage said and everything. And I'm going to propose a mill rate of 7%, 7 7.00. So it'll give slight tax relief to uh, people in the city of Sparta. Hey, Mr. And, Asher, real quick, um, you said 7%. Did you mean $7? $7. A, a $7 mill rate. Yeah, okay. $7. Thank you for the clarification. Yes, sir. So that's my proposal or resolution. Looking for a second. I have a motion from Mr. Gary Asher of a mill rate of $7. Do I have a second? Marla Leverage, I second that motion. I have a second from Ms. Mrs. Marla Leverage. All in favor? Oh, yes. Do we have further discussion on this? All right, hearing no discussion. <laughs> Mrs. Lopez, please state your name. Thank you, my name is Amy Lopez. Ms. Hauser, at a $7 mill rate, can you tell us, you, are you able to figure what our total tax collected from the community would be? With about two minutes, I can. Sure, yeah. I'll wait. <laughs> With a $7 mill rate, our levy for general operations or fund 10 would not change because that's controlled by the revenue limit. Our levy for fund 80 would not change community service. The levy for debt service or uh, fund 39 would become 6170000 So it would be the prepayment that we did last year plus an additional 1.1 million for a total school levy of 11,480,000. So the total school levy portion, it will stay about that. The breakdown between fund 10 and fund 39 is subject to change come October 15th. Understood, thank yep. you. So about 11 million would be the total tax levy. 11.5. 11.5 yeah. million as opposed to, did I say 11.8 million at the 7.19? Correct. So the loss of state aid would be, yep, 40% of that, but I don't, 300. <laughs> About 300. Yeah, I could, let me plug it in the calculator. Pat, what is it? What's that? 120, 120,000? 120,000, so it would be insignificant in, a $42 million budget. So, yep. So a decrease in 120,000 would equal additional taxes next year of 120,000. Yep, thank you, yep. Thank you, yeah, please, Mrs. Leverage. Or there is the microphone there. Oh, Mr. Sanders was so <laughs> excited about using, <laughs> and he was ready to roll. All right, go, go question, for it, please. Marla Leverage. Um, so if you read, so with that seven, dollar mill rate um the regular payment on the debt is 2.2 million and what would be the new prepayment of the debt dollar amount 
Yep, it will go down by about 800,000, um, which I'm running these numbers on the fly. So <laughs> I wanna confirm all of this, um, but it looks like it'd go down about 800,000 to 6,170,000. Oh, sorry, thank you. Uh, okay, so 2.2 .2 million required would stay the same and the prepayment would be about 3.9 million. Correct, yep. Thank you, Mrs. Leverage. Is there any further discussion? Uh, please, yeah, come forward. Or, oh, Mr. Sanders is ready to go. All right, if you could just state your first name and then Thank you. I'm free. Teresa and I'm just wondering what does that um, compute then to each individual tax bill per th per $100,000. I'm sorry, I missed the, it. The reduction in the mill rate would uh, equate to what of a reduction at it in the 10 per $100,000 of your tax bill. Mm hmm. So it'd be a dollar thirty per one thousand dollars of property value. A dollar thirty per one. Thank you very much. Yep, per one thousand dollar of property value. So depending on, um, and again, that's an estimate because assessed value. There's some ratios that'll play a part there. So that's the average. But keep in mind, if your home value increased or decreased, that assessed value will. It's not dollar for dollar. So that's the average. Thank you. You're welcome. Any further discussion from members? All right, hearing no further discussion, uh, motion for $7 mill rate next year. All in favor, please raise your hand. All right, so I have 16 there. Okay, um, those not in favor. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. I have surpassed 16. Okay, um, so that resolution fails. That motion fails. Uh, I apologize. Yes, the motion for $7 fails. I'd like Do we to have. Make I would like to make a motion to approve the tax levy as presented at 749. I have a motion from Mr. Mike Roddick to maintain the uh, mill rate at the recommended $7.49. Do I have a second? Off to the left over here. Please state your name. Althea Stanley, I second the motion. Thank you, Mrs. Stanley, I have a second. Is there any further discussion? Um, so we have- I'm Mr. sorry, I'm sorry. First, Mike, that was, first was by Mr. Roddick and the second was from- Althea Stanley. All right, is there any further discussion on the motion that is presently on the table? Okay, seeing no discussion, um, those in favor of a $7.49 mill rate? Um, yes, raise your hand, please. Uh, I don't know that we need to count that. I feel that, well, oh, well, absolutely count it. Yep, so. Uh, What have we got? <laughs> I see all three of you back there working on it. I have 36 yeas. Those not in favor, please raise your hand.
I have 15, 16 nays. All right, the motion passes. The mill rate for the following year will be $7. Oh, I'm sorry. And, and once again, just to clarify, yep, please. this is just for a recommendation to the Board of Education. They will take action on this um, on October 5th, October 25th at seven o'clock right here. So thank you for that, Mr. Russ. Yeah, Mr. Bullen, please. Thank you. I'd like to point out something that my friend just Speak noticed. just a little bit louder. Oh, thank you. I'd like to point something out that I want people to know for reference, that everybody that's a staff member that works in the school district voted for the 749. The but taxpayers, you, correct? They are taxpayers. Okay, thank you. Did, did you have but, any? But, but I wanted to point out, that's why we need more community involvement. There's only like 65 people here. So I, I, what I want to do is commend you guys on your transparency. I have to admit, it's really nice to see that you're putting it on YouTube. This has been one of the best documents I have ever seen in 23 years here. But I, I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. That absolutely means a lot coming from you, Mr. Bullen. Thank you for that. OK. I don't even know where to go from here. All right, if you're OK, Mr. Chairman, I could. All right, the resolution. Oh, yeah. Uh, Mr. Hendricks here. We're now in the resolution B. So I would like, uh, John Hendricks, I would like to move resolutions B through F, please. Okay, just one moment here. Okay, so. So, so, I, so Mr. Hendricks, I just want to clarify. You're making a motion to approve resolutions B C, D, E, and F, correct? Okay, so we have a motion on the floor to approve items B, 12B through 12F. Do I have a second to that motion? I, no. I okay, so just one second. No. Do, yep, do I have a second? Mr. Burns Gilbert, I see your hand up there. Please I state your full you. name. Colin Burns Gilbert, I second that motion. All right, I have a second to the motion of 12B through 12F. Do we have any further discussion on these topics? And Mrs. Leverage, go for it. I was having a question regarding, can we have a motion that those all be lumped together first? Or is it that they all get lumped together and they're all gonna get passed? So um, that, to me, that seems like there should be two separate motions, one to motion that we vote and put them all together as one, and then have a motion to approve all the ones that were put together. Do you, know what, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah I understand, understand what, what you're saying. Russ. However, we did have a motion that it was seconded that B through F, F were to be approved. And then we did get a second. So ultimately, unless... Mr. Hendricks or Mr. Burns Gilbert removes their motion, we would vote on it. And if needed, it would be voted down and then we would look for more motions. All right, so, uh, discussion. Ms. Mrs. Weber, I see your hand up in the back there. Mr. Mr. Asher, we'll get to you for sure. I don't, maybe I was, I was thinking too much or not paying enough attention, but resolutions 12B through, where are we fighting these? Page 13. Okay. Page three. And I will, we have the one on student transportation authorizing the Board of Education to transport students. We have the authorization of the Board of Education for nutrition services, the authorization for instructional materials, the compensation of board members. And on the screen right now is the current rate, which would continue. It is uh, annual salaries. Yes. It's um, 2,400 for the board president, 2,200 for the board clerk, and then 1,900 for the rest of the other board members, their annual salary. And then finally with board expenses, the current is uh, listed there is um, 
when on district business, either in or out of the district, per diem allowances of $125 per day for up to three days per year and 30 day, $30 per day after three days. Did that answer your question, Ms. Weber? Just wanted to make sure you, okay, okay. thank you. No, that absolutely, no problem. Mr. Asher, please. I don't want to put uh, words in Mrs. Leverich's mouth, but what I thought she was doing was addressing the parliamentarian for a clarification of proper procedure under Robert's rules of order. So what is it, who's the parliamentarian and are they ruling that that motion could be made by itself or what's the ruling on that? Well, our parliamentarian, we wanted to have one here, but they couldn't make it. Um, so it's my understanding that under Robert's rules of order, when we have a motion, we have a second. We have to continue with the vote unless the first or second who made the motion withdraws their motion. I think that's incorrect. If the motion isn't a proper motion, then you shouldn't be voting on it. And well, so, but well, you're going to vote. I mean, it's going to be voted yes anyhow. So, so I, I, I don't know. I, I guess I'm under. I'm not clear on how it's an improper motion. I didn't say it was. Oh, okay. I, I was asking for clarification. Okay. It it seems out of order. Um, I was just asking okay. the question. Okay. Thank you. I apologize, Mr. Hendricks. If you'd like to. Just one moment. Just one moment. Yeah, let's get a microphone. Okay, the motion is withdrawn. Okay. So that being said, we will go back to item B. There we go. No, we only need no. one withdrawal. Yep. Thank you. Okay, so is there any discussion? Uh, to authorize the Board of Education to provide transportation as stated in the agenda. Yeah, I have Mr. some right back here. Straight back, Mr. Sanders. Thank you. Please state your full name. Missy Erickson, um, I move that items B through F be brought together for a vote. Oh, okay. So but Go ahead. So that was the motion that Mr. Hendricks just withdrew. Do you? This is okay. I maybe I'm just understanding. I was told I'm good by Ms. Hauser. All right. Do I have a second? I have a second from Mrs. Ms. Heidi Prestwood. Those voting in favor, please raise your hand. All right. Did you have discussion? Oh, we're just in B. No. Okay, it's okay. All right, everybody lower your hands for a moment. Mr. Dace, if you wanna just step up to the podium, that'd be great, thank you. My question was just on letter F, is that the same as it, what the amounts, are they the same as they were last year? Yes, sir, okay. yes. Okay, all right, so if you're voting in favor of items B through F, please raise your hand one more time. Being put together. Being put together. Yes, Being we haven't, together. right. How are we looking? 47. 47 or 48? Oh, I'm not going there. I'm going to go with 47. 47. Okay, thank you. Uh, those not in favor, please raise your hand. All right, we have five. Five not in favor. Thank you, Stacy. Okay. All right, so that motion carries. Do I have a motion to approve items 12B through 12F? I'll make that motion. I have a motion from Mr. Sam Russ. Do I have a second? I have a second from Ms. Wendy Burnett or Dr. Wendy Burnett. Those in favor? 
Oh, I'm sorry, you guys. Is there any further discussion? Hearing no discussion, those in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, 45 yeas. Um, those not in favor, please raise your hand. I have one nay. Okay, motion carries. Item 12G, discussion and approval of the time and date of the 2023 annual meeting. Let me take this one, Mr. Schultz. Absolutely. So if we stay with our current format, uh, as a reminder, not a reminder, um, in November, we're switching our board meetings to Mondays. So November 14th will be our next board of, um, in November. Uh, the next formal board meeting will be October 25th at seven. So what we did this year is we went an hour and a half past our committee meeting. So meeting that in October, the second Monday in October and for 2023 is October 9th. Our committee and full board meetings are gonna be at six o'clock. So that would be the recommendation. If we do keep the same, would be a corresponding date of Monday, October 9th, 2023 at 7.30 PM. And most likely it will be here, but we'll establish that date, the, the location as, as we get closer. Mr. Dace. Could you come over to the microphone, Mr. Dace? Sorry, for those listening at home. Gordon Dace. Gordon Dace. Is it possible to do it after the state does its thing so that we don't have this if then what if? That That is totally up to the the, the electric today. And uh, in well, the I mean, sometimes there's a time issue when you yep. have to have it in. Yep. I, that oh. has been the issue in the past. Thank you. Um, so we have to certify the budget by the end of October with the tax levy so we can get the tax bills out first part of November. Uh, Last year, we did it at the end of October so that we had those October 15th numbers and the feedback at last year's annual meeting was that didn't give the electorate, basically we went straight from the annual meeting into the board setting the budget and tax levy. And so the electorate last year said it would be nice to have that two week window so they could continue to process and have discussions with board members. Yeah, but we, we want to know real numbers when we're making decisions here. So is, yep. there, is there a date that doesn't have to be a Monday or can we do it? We can do it any time. I would, my recommendation, any day, it has to be done by October 31st. And my recommendation would be prior to uh, our scheduled board meeting, which is 14, the, the 23rd of October. So I would recommend if, if what you're, if I'm hearing you correctly, anywhere between October 15th and October 23rd, keep in mind that the closer we get to October 23rd, the less time the board would have opportunity for feedback and more input. What day is the 17th? Oh, sorry. Uh, so October 15th is when we get the data. And then we need time to update everything, print all the books, get it published. So we would need to allow at least a couple of days for that process to complete before the annual meeting to have everything reflected. So 18th, 19th? You said 23rd, right? The 23rd, I believe, would be the board Max. meeting. We would recommend, unless we push the board meeting back, we could do that. Um, but ultimately, if the electric uh, sets that date, we would have to work our best to do what we can, knowing that if we put it on the 16th, we wouldn't have that accurate of number. So yeah. I can guarantee you we're going to try our best. So, but if, if you want to propose a date, I'd recommend you're welcome to put a motion in. Yeah, I'd make a proposal that the annual meeting is on the 19th next year to try to give everybody some. I'd like to amend the motion that the meeting be on the 19th and it starts at 6.30 p.m. I'm Please. sorry, could you state your name? Alice Ackerman, that we have a meeting on the 19th starting at 6.30 p.m. Um, Stacy. Um, I just wonder, what is the possibility of being able to have that annual meeting in a way that people could virtually vote? Yeah, we talked about that this year. We're going we're gonna to look into that for next year. We absolutely are. 
Yeah, that would pro that would help a little bit more balancing between sure. employees and other taxpayers. Yeah, we'll see what the options are and and if that's possible. Absolutely. October nineteenth. I'm Austin Lee, and I second the motion. All right, so I have a motion. Up for, I'm sorry. Could you state your name one more time? Liam. Oh yeah, Austin. Awesome. I got you, man. Yep, you're good. Uh, down here in the in the green. Yep. At, Alice Ackerman. The motion for October nineteenth, two thousand twenty-three, at six thirty p.m. And I have a second from Mr. Austin Lee. Well, hold on, Is Mr. Jace. Are you okay? Well, before Go we for it. continue on, I'm not one hundred percent parliamentarian, but Mr. Jace, are you okay with a six thirty start time? So is it, so would you, you're, is, is that okay? We amend it to 6.30? Perfect. They're both okay. fine to that. And then second it, and you can second that, Mr. Ms. Ackerman? And okay, and Mr. Lee, are you okay with not being on the record for this one? <laughs> and then we have any discussion. So right now we have October, October 19th at 6.30 p.m. 2023. Any discussion? I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I'm glad after three hours, we can all still be smiling. So I'm okay with this. All right, those in favor, please raise your hand. I think that's a unanimous vote. Okay, we have a unanimous vote. I would take a motion to adjourn this annual meeting. Mr. Hendricks, I have a motion. I have a second from Mr. Funkhauser in the background. Did you hear that, Heidi? Okay, I have a motion from Mr. Hendricks and a second from Eric Funkhauser. All in favor? Uh, we are adjourned. Thank, thank you, you very much, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you.